The practice of listening is, in a very deep way, starting to recognize the, this ongoing selfing that interferes. And I don't say selfing in a disparaging way, but this ongoing tendency to try to reassert that there's a person here that, want, that needs to be approved or wants to prove or control, just to notice it. Just notice. As long as that's going on, we can't listen to understand. So we can't really pay attention and sense, well, what is this person really saying? Who is here? Where is it coming from? What, what's, what's really going on? We can't listen for that because our attention has narrowed into the wanting self or the controlling self or the fearing self, right? So it's only when we start loosening the grip of that selfing that we can actually notice the truth. So I am touching on both the yin and the yang of listening presence. There's letting go of that selfing, so there's that openness. And in that openness, that engagement that wants to know what's true. And our habit, our defensive habit, instead of wanting to know what's true, is assuming we already know. We're with somebody and we make all these assumptions, rather than, as I think it was T.S. Eliot said in the cocktail party, let this person be a stranger. You're meeting them for the first time in this moment. It's a mystery. But we, we make our interpretations, and our interpretations uh, cover over what's real. And we all do it. As soon as somebody starts talking, we use the filter of our own experience. Oh yeah, as a mom, I know what that one's like, or you know, whatever it is. There's a cartoon of Henry VIII and, and one of his wives, and there's a mediator with them. <laughs> right? Okay, And the mediator is saying to Henry, you say off with her head, but what I hear is, I feel neglected. <laughs> the next frame is, you see a headless mediator, right? <laughs> he got that wrong. <laughs> so we make our interpretations. So the key is to listen without controlling, with that receptivity that really wants to know. This is uh, the way Mark Nepo puts it. He says, to listen is to lean in softly with a willingness to be changed by what we hear. Wait, let me say that one again. To listen is to lean in softly with a willingness to be changed by what we hear. This is the undefended heart. Okay, so I'll give you a chance, we'll take a pause together to um, allow the person you were considering, bring that person to mind. And you might allow yourself to consider the circumstances that you have conversations with this person. So you actually bring your attention to some, a, a, a real live kind of situation. What might be going on? And if you sense, as you bring mindfulness to this relationship, that there's um, some conflicts, some strong wants or fears, just let that be there so you can really deepen your attention right now. Because you're asking this question again, what is between me and listening with an away card? What stops me? You can just scan a little if, if the person's talking. Is there something you're wanting? Is there a way you're wanting the conversation to go? Some way you're wanting the person to experience you? Are you wanting their cooperation? Are 
Or is there something you're fearing as you're listening? Are you fearing this person's judgment or that they're going to get away with something? That things are, they're going to get their way if you just listen? Imagine what would happen if you really put down any agenda and just listen. What bad could happen? You might notice and reflect on when you're in a conversation with this person, what are the ways that you distract? What are the ways that you get in the way of listening? In other words, do you uh, find that you go off into other thought trains and don't pay attention? Do you try to steer the conversation? Do you ignore certain things? Do you plan your response? Are you making interpretations? So again, just to notice your strategies of trying to defend or get what you want. And again, you might imagine, well, what would it be like if I just put that down for a little bit? And as you explore, you might just sense your intention to bring this into awareness when you're talking, to bring uh, whatever you're noticing more into consciousness, Sense your intention to connect. You can just keep that, that awareness, this atmosphere inside you as you continue to listen, because I'd like to, and feel free to open your eyes if you'd like, I'd like to touch in now to what is the healing that happens when we offer a listening presence? Um, because there's a really huge impact. In, in the simplest way, I feel like when we offer a listening presence, it creates an atmosphere of love and safety. It said that attention is the purest expression of love. Our attention is the purest expression of love. So when we are, have a listening presence and there's not a self thing going and there's just that space and that, that kind of tender, wakeful, engaged, what's true for you? That is a very pure atmosphere for, for just nourishing another being. There's a, a friend described this, a friend asked his, was talking to his son, he said, I asked Ollie what he thinks his heart does. It's this young son's named Ollie. And his answer was, it's in my skeleton and it makes people say hello. <laughs> There's something about when we offer a listening presence that it brings out other people. And my favorite metaphor for this that I share when I talk about this is of a fountain. And that our being is like a fountain, like a, this life is this creative dynamic expression of awareness. That it's just awareness in its just dynamic way. And it has all different flavors of intelligence and love and creativity. And when we haven't been listened to, when there's not the mirroring, the understanding, the safety, that fountain gets clogged up. So rather than expressing our beingness from that source, that purity, that awareness, there's a clogging up. And some of it comes out, but it comes out a little torqued and twisted and certainly not with its full aliveness and freedom and brilliance and beauty. 
So a lot of us go around with clogged up inner fountains, right? Because we haven't been listened to well, you know. And I want to add that we haven't listened well to ourselves because meditation is a way of unclogging the fountain. Okay, does that make sense? We're doing inner listening. But this is about how we offer a meditative listening presence to others. And so what happens when the fountains clog, the way a person will speak or express themselves will sometimes sound stagnant or contrived or packaged or routine because they're not kind of coming from that freshness. It's more murky. Sometimes it'll seem nervous or speedy you know, just different ways. There's no silences because there's no connection with what's inside. So when we listen, we're inviting a kind of connecting and coming from source. And that fountain can begin to flow and it allows people to start expressing a deeper truth for them and to shine. But it doesn't happen all at once. Sometimes when we offer a listening attention, we first get the different layers that have been kind of caked and muddied up. And so it takes patience, a kind of interest and a willingness just to be, and an acceptance of that. So the story that I'll share on this, which um, is a story that, that'll be in uh, True Refuge when it comes out in, in February, and it's the, one, the ones that most touched me, was a woman who had uh, done a workshop and had listened to this metaphor and was very intentional about her listening capacities. And she, um, her mother was her person, just like I asked you today to think of who. Her mother, uh, Audrey, was a well-known writer, wealthy, successful, brilliant, and very narcissistic woman. So, so much so that her daughters, um, went, once they graduated from high school, uh, tried moved to, so they could be thousands of miles away from her and barely ever visited her. She treated, her, the mother treated people as these kind of orbiting satellites to reflect her whatever. And some people were willing to do it and she'd regale them with stories. She was a very compelling person, but after a while it could be tiring. So for this woman, uh, she decided she was going to, she had a conference nearby where her mother lived. She decided she was going to spend some time with her mom and practice and see what was possible. And during their time together, when she would listen to her mother, she, she'd feel a lot of resistance and a lot of judgment. So the first part of listening, because her mother was doing her thing, was to bring a lot of listening, presence, and compassion to her own resistance. In other words, if you're going to take on this incredible adventure of listening, make sure that it's got a very, starts with a very self-forgiving, self-compassionate, kind of a, an intention because of course you're going to have reactions. That's a given. So the first thing she did is just forgive that she was feeling resistant and judgmental and annoyed and so on. And as she brought kindness to her own experience, she kind of softened and she started being able to say, okay, whatever, whatever comes out, I'm just, there's just a space for it. Um, so she meant, she describes it that sometimes it, she got panicky because she kind of regressed into being the kid that was suffocated and overwhelmed and had no existence other than, you know, as a kind of mirror for her mother. But she said um, that after some time, after she had kind of was compassionate with herself, she started to bring some humor about it and she could breathe and forgive her own reactions and say, okay, space, there's room for her. Even though it's a huge amount of room, there's room for her, whatever comes out. And she would coach herself. She'd say, now, what is happening? And she'd say, my mother's talking. I am quiet. There's endless time. I hear it, every word, and what is beyond the word. I hear who she is. And these are some of the coaching pieces. And um, I think they're really powerful. What happens when we say there is endless time? I mean, we have such a sense that there's not enough time just to say there's time for this. There really is time. It's a choice. I'm listening. 
I hear every word. I hear what is beyond the words. I'm listening into who she is. It gets interesting. So as it got interest more for her, that listening became deeper, she began to hear her mother's desperation as if she was saying over and over again, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. It's like this desperate asserting that she existed. I'm here and I matter. And so the more she took in her mother's pain, the more she softened, of course, with care. And so it was through her presence that she was able to communicate back I'm listening and you matter. Very, very real communication. I'm listening and you matter. And her mother started to relax. There started to be longer pauses between stories. And her mother sat back more in her chair, slowed down, seemed more reflective. So several days before she was going to leave, uh, her mother began to tell her that she felt alone and unappreciated. So this is again, this fountain's unclogging and now she's beginning to name her vulnerability, which is a phase in it, right? Okay. So she said, I feel alone and unappreciated. And this is when Kate, the daughter, responded really honestly and she said, Mom, it's because you don't listen to people. And her mother froze, but she didn't get defensive because Kate had been so present. She had offered such uncritical sympathy. She had, in other words, she would established trust and safety that her mother trusted her words. <clears throat> so her mother wanted to know more. She said, please tell me, I need to know. And Kate explained how for her and her sister, for their dad, now for her stepdad, she said, when, pe when you don't listen, people feel like they don't matter, like they're not known. And it's true, you can't know them if you don't listen, you can't be close. So her mother looked at her with a sorrow that really pierced her heart. She got through and uh, something changed. You know, maybe the pain of alienation broke down her defenses. But she knew she needed to change and she started to listen and fast forward after her sister joined them for the holidays and was bore witness and said that for the first time in her life she felt like a real person at home, that she existed. And so there's this, this shift and it shifted also with uh, this woman's relationship with now her, her new husband that they had, because they had stopped doing things together. They had kind of, were on a parallel separate paths, long dinners and evening walks that had ended shortly after their marriage. So there is a real power that this woman found in being able to hang out with it. I'm, I use this story, I wanted to share this story because it's not always as hard, but it can be, it can take real patience. And yet, it's the most powerful healing I know to offer this, it's really offering loving presence to another by clearing that space of our own, uh, I want it this way, I don't want this, and just quietly taking another in. So at the beginning I was talking about the different domains that, um, that listening heals in and that it clearly in our relationships with each other um, to take turns listening. I, when I work with couples it's, it's that process, when, especially when there's a conflict of just let one person speak if the other can just listen and say back what they hear so that the person speaking feels heard something softens, something opens. And if we take turns doing this, we start coming towards understanding. When there's understanding, fear goes down. When fear goes down, trust emerges. Adrian Rich says, an honorable human relationship that is one in which two people have the right to use the word love is a process of deepening the truths they can tell each other. It's a process of deepening the truths they can tell each other. 
it's important to do this because it breaks down human self-delusion and isolation. What allows us to tell the truth? It has to be safe enough. There has to be a space of listening presence. Now, so this is on a personal level. Inter- in terms of around the globe, if we truly want to respond to the cycles of violence, we need to train ourselves and then train others to listen to each other. It's the only way. It's the only way that we can break down the uh, unreal other and the cycles of hostility. And to me, the most beautiful example of it is the truth and reconciliation hearings. It's just, it's just such a powerful example. Um, many testified to the atrocities they endured under apartheid and they spoke of the healing that came by giving verbal testimony and being listened to. I mean, that's amazing. This is the most, the most horrific torment and loss and that there's a possibility of healing when we're listened to. And when it happens in a society, to me that is the evolution of consciousness, bearing witness to that. One young man who had been blinded when a policeman shot him in the face at close range said, I feel what has brought my eyesight back is to come here and tell the story. I feel what has been making me sick all the time is the fact that I couldn't tell my story. Listening creates relationship. There's nothing that exists in isolation, but our pain is when we perceive we're separate and listening creates the connection. So we've been exploring, you know, how it's this pathway to connection and I wanted to read you um, a short poem by Nick Penna called Waiting in Line. He says, When you listen, you reach into dark corners and pull out your wonders. When you listen, your ideas come in and out like they were waiting in line. Your ears don't always listen. It can be your brain, your fingers, your toes. You can listen anywhere. Your mind might not want to go. If you can listen, you can find answers to questions you didn't know. If you have listened, truly listened, you don't find yourself alone. Nick Penna is in fifth grade, okay? If you listen, you don't find yourself alone. Listening is the pathway to intimacy. If we can pause and listen inwardly, we become intimate with our own being. If we can listen to each other, we find out who we are together. So I think of it as a a sacred art and as I mentioned, like any art, it takes uh, a kind of dedication to practice. So we'll close tonight with just a brief, again, practice in, in this listening. We begin with listening to the words of Mary Oliver. What can I say that I have not said before? So I'll say it again. The leaf has a song in it. Stone is the face of patience. Inside the river there is an unfinishable story and you are somewhere in it and it will never end until all ends. Take your busy heart to the art museum and the chamber of commerce, but take it also to the forest. The song you heard singing in the leaf when you were a child is singing still. I am of years lived so far, 74, and the leaf is singing still. I am of years lived so far, 74, and the leaf is singing still. So in this stillness, opening the senses, 
listening to the sounds that are in the room. Listening to the silence. Letting this world of sound wash through you. Be that open, empty heart that sound and sensation and life can move through, live through. Can you sense the silence that's listening right now? The vastness that's all happening in? That tenderness that tender openness that's listening to the thoughts, the sounds, the silence. You might imagine bringing this listening presence into conversation, communication with a particular person Just having the intention to contact this open, wakeful presence. To pause and then pause again and again. Letting go into this open, empty heart that's just listening. May we awaken into that presence that listens to our own hearts, that presence that listens to each other, to our earth and our world. May this serve the healing of all beings, the awakening and freedom of all beings. Namaste.